Watson joining us to talk about the three best habits that you should have to improve your self-directed IRA investing. So it's always a pleasure to have Jeff here. He's actually joining us from Puerto Rico right now. So really appreciate you taking time out of your trip to, to come join us today. But before we get started, I do have just a couple of quick slides that I do want to go through. If you've watched our webinars before, you've definitely seen some of these intro slides, but we always like to start out with this to kind of give you guys a little bit more information about who we are at Quest, why we like to put on these events, and some of our other upcoming educational opportunities that we have coming up this spring. So quick commercial about us, who is Quest Trust? We are a self-directed IRA custodian based out of Houston, Texas. We do have offices in Dallas and Austin as well, but we do have clients pretty much all across the country. We hold about $2 billion in assets under management, so we are a pretty good sized company. We're kind of a you know, homegrown family company grown from Houston, Texas uh, since 2004. And you can actually kind of see here in my background, that's actually Quincy and Nathan, the founder and president of our company. And um, if you are not familiar with Quincy and Nathan, they are really awesome. You should definitely check out some of their videos that we have on our website. Now, we do have about 100 employees uh, here in Houston, Austin, and Dallas, and you'll notice that a lot of us do hold this designation of a CISP, which is a Certified IRA Services Professional. So in order to achieve that designation, you actually have to have worked at an IRA company for at least two years, and then pass a pretty tough exam hosted by the American Banking Association. So if you are working either with our IRA specialist, or maybe some of our transactions team, even our accounting departments, um, you'll notice that a lot of us do hold this designation. So we're nerds, we love IRAs, and we love to make this process of self-directing your IRA as smooth and as easy as possible for you. Now, quick disclaimer, this is very important. Quest Trust does not give tax, legal, or investment advice. We put on a lot of events. We bring in a lot of guest speakers on our webinars, but we do not provide investments. We do not endorse any products or services. Um, and all of our webinars are strictly for educational purposes only. So please do your own due diligence. I know you'll probably hear Jeff talk about this a little bit today, but this is so important for not only your own investments, but for your IRA investments as well. Now, at Quest, we hold self-directed IRAs. So really, there's no legal distinction between the IRAs that we hold at Quest and your IRA that you might currently have at any other custodian. The only difference is the types of assets that our clients are able to hold in their IRAs here at Quest. So we do not hold any stocks, mutual funds, any of those kind of normal publicly traded securities. But at Quest, as I was mentioning, that $2 billion in assets under management, that is all alternative privately held assets that our clients choose to hold in their IRA accounts. Now, I definitely recommend setting up a free consultation with one of our IRA specialists if you are interested in learning more about this and how you can maybe you know, apply this to your personal situation in your life. But there are a lot of different benefits to having at least some of your funds in a self-directed IRA. It allows you to truly diversify that retirement portfolio. It allows you to shelter the investments that you hold in your IRA from your own income taxes, and capital gains taxes as well. And you know, last but not least, you guys are joining us on a Saturday in the middle of the day on a weekend. There's a good chance that a lot of you guys on this call are real estate investors. So you can actually apply the knowledge that you have as a real estate investor, whatever strategies you might like to use for investing, you can also do this with your IRA. And, you know, I always like to tell people it's not necessarily a replacement for your business or your investments that you are currently doing. But in addition to that, as a part of your long term wealth building plan, it is essential to have at least some of your investments in an IRA where it's growing completely tax deferred or tax free. So that's kind of my little commercial there about Quest. You know, we really specialize in educating investors all across the U.S. about how these IRAs work, the different types of accounts that can be self-directed. And we have a lot of resources as far as, you know, the investment process, the different types of invest investments that you can do, how to grow small amounts. Um, we pretty much educate over everything to do with self-directed IRAs. Now, these seven different types of accounts, 
we see a lot of people that actually have multiple of these where, you know, between someone and their family, someone and their spouse, they might have 401ks that they've rolled over. They might have Roth IRAs that they're starting to grow. Maybe you have self-employment income, or maybe you are looking to self-direct a health savings account or a Coverdell education savings account. At the end of my couple of slides here, I do have our information of how to reach out to an IRA specialist. Even if you are already a client of Quest, I know we get a lot of clients watching us on here. If you haven't spoken with an IRA specialist in a while, it's always good to kind of have a quick brush up and make sure that you are really doing everything that you should to maximize these retirement savings and the savings for your health expenses and qualified educational expenses as well. Now, as I was saying, all of the investments that we hold at Quest are privately held assets. And remember, it is truly 100% self-directed. So you actually get to choose the investments that go into your IRA account, how those deals are structured, who you choose to work with. There are a few restrictions. You know, you can't really personally benefit from your own IRA investment. We do have several other classes that go into that. But whatever you might be interested in, whether it's holding physical real estate or maybe being a little bit more passive through investing passively into multifamily deals, commercial syndications, or maybe just being a private lender or purchasing existing promissory notes. You have a lot of different options. And again, this is really a great way to diversify your retirement investments because these investments are actually tangible. You know, they're not like stocks where it just goes up and down crazily sometimes, and all you've got is a piece of paper um, to back that behind it. Now, that's our quick little commercial about Quest, but I do want to walk you guys through just a few of the educational uh, webinars and opportunities that we have coming up. So for those of you guys who don't know me, my name's Haley. I kind of lead our business development and help to put on a lot of these events for everyone with the rest of our marketing team. So we work very hard to get our resources as up to date and as uh, valuable as possible. We have a great YouTube channel where we post several videos every single week. And you can also rewatch all of our weekly webinars that we host on our YouTube as well. So pretty much every class we've ever hosted is either available on Facebook or on YouTube, but YouTube's a little bit easier to use. It's um, It'll kind of know your algorithm as well. So that helps us out a lot. And one other event that I want to focus on on here is our virtual networking happy hours that we host. So the virtual happy hours, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a Zoom meeting. So everyone actually gets the chance to share their cameras, introduce themselves, and we all kind of have a, a beer or a glass of wine together and then talk about some current things going on in the real estate investing world. These happy hours have been really fun. They've been a really high quality. We've had anywhere from 50 to 70 investors from all across the U.S. join us at these happy hours. And they are on the first and third Wednesday of every month. So the next one is actually next Wednesday, uh, February 17th at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. Now, I can see these messages popping up in the chat here. We do have Nicole, one of our other IRA specialists, she's online with us today and she's moderating today's webinar. So be sure to check out some of the links that she's been putting in the chat for you guys. And if you are interested in opening an account, Nicole can be a great point of contact for you there as well. Now, a big event that we have coming up this spring that you should definitely mark your calendars for is QuestCon Live Private Lending Edition. QuestCon is completely online. It is a online self-directed IRA conference. Over the course of two days, we'll have just over 20 different guest speakers, and this will actually be our third edition of QuestCon Live um, since 2020 has moved everything online. And this is a very high quality event. Tickets right now are in pre-sales. They are $50. They do go up in price on March 15th. And we do have the recording as an additional little upcharge there as well, if you want to be able to rewatch the event at pretty much any point in time. So QuestCon Live, we put a lot of effort into these online conferences. It's a lot of fun. You, uh, We have some ways that you can network with the other attendees as well. So it is great to meet other investors. But if you have questions, just reach out to us. 
feel free to reach out directly to Nicole. She's actually one of our newer IRA specialists, but she has an extensive background in banking and retirement accounts as well. So if you're interested in setting up a free consultation, uh, scan the QR code right here, go to our website. You can send us a chat there or uh, send us an email at IRA specialists at questtrust.com. Now, just a couple little promotions that we have going on this month, just really quick here at the end. We are bringing back Quest Cares right now. So for every account that we open in the month of February, we are donating to various charities um, around the US. And we have also revamped our referral program. So if you know other investors that you would like to refer to Quest and they open up an account, make sure that they put your name and the promo code referral on their application and you will each get a $25 credit to your account. And what's cool is there is no limit to the number of people that you refer to Quest. So if you get it moving, you refer a bunch of people to us, it could definitely add a fair amount of credits to your account for this year. So that's all I've got for you guys. Um, I hope that you found that helpful. You know, at Quest, we try to be as accessible as possible and we try to put on as best education as we can. But without further ado, I want to go ahead and pass the torch off to Jeff Watson. The reason that you guys are all actually here today um, is not for me, it's for Jeff. But Jeff, hopefully you're still there. Yes, go ahead and share your screen. I will come back on at the end for some Q&A. So if you guys have questions, be sure to drop them in the Q&A box. And Jeff, I'm excited to see your presentation. Go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Well, Haley, that is always, um, always great just listening to you and hearing about all the amazing things that Quest is doing and growing and teaching and sharing and leading. Uh, I am a huge, huge fan of Quest Trust and I love these opportunities. So I'm going to start out really slowly because I want to make sure that the internet connection is stable here because I'm not in my home office. I'm not where I've got high speed access all to myself. I'm having to use Wi Fi at a VRBO in um, a lovely location. So just if I can get just to, somebody just tell me that yeah you can hear me and see me that would be great. Please don't put it in the chat. Just tell me so I'm you know I'm an auditory guy, not a visual guy. All right, Nicole, thank you. Haley, thank you. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. All right, so we're going to talk about three habits that will make you a better self-directed IRA investor. Um, this is, we're going to cover a little bit of background material, just like Haley did. And then we're going to get into, um, the big investor stuff. This is the stuff that distinguishes the real serious investors from the kind of sort of, maybe if I get lucky and the moon comes up just right, and this happens, then I'll have a good account. No, we're going to talk about the stuff that really makes a difference, but like I have to do this. This presentation is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information with regard to the subject matter being covered. It's provided with the understanding that the presenter is not currently engaged in rendering legal, accounting, or other professional advice. If legal advice or other expert professional assistance is required, the services of a competent professional person should be sought. All right. So who am I? Some of you don't know who I am, so I'm just going to bore you a little bit with who I am and so on, and then we'll get into the really meat, meat of this thing. I am an attorney licensed to practice in the state of Ohio now for my 30th year. I'm working on Texas as well. I'm privileged to serve as general counsel to RealFlow LLC out of Parma Heights, Ohio, National CRM, one of the largest for real estate investors, National Real Estate Investors Association, Note School, which is out of Dallas, Texas, and National Wealth Builders, which is out of Dayton, Ohio. I am an attorney. I practice full time. I invest part time. And the vast majority of the stuff I work on now is involving self directed IRA transactions and clients, particularly in some lending area. And I have also been a successful part time real estate investor now for getting close to 30 years. Whew, man, I've been investing for as long as my oldest child has been alive, as you know, we, we bought our first investment property um, a week after we brought her home from the hospital. So yeah. So a couple of things. Um, I've influenced national housing policy twice when it comes to distressed sale transactions. I publish every 
twice a week, I publish a newsletter email blog at watsoninvested.com, watsoninvested.com, free content, enjoy it, absorb it. I'm also privileged to be a member of the board of directors of Quest Trust Company. And um, I've done, I've had a pretty successful career in the state of Ohio with changing the law there. The last time we did it had to do with making it um, easier for landlords to screen tenants regarding disability applications with uh, service animals and pets. All right, so a little bit of background. We're transitioning here. A little bit of transition here. Um, enough about me, let's get into some content. These are my slides recapping some of what Haley said. Self-directed investing is where you, the account holder, make decisions and investments on behalf of your retirement account using a qualified trustee or custodian like Quest Trust Company. There's a variety of accounts that you can self-direct. My favorite is the self-directed Roth IRA. So I generally will refer to stuff as a SIDRA, S-D-I-R-A, self-directed IRA. I'll sometimes call it a Roth SIDRA, but just think I'm covering all of the seven accounts that Haley showed you earlier when I make the comment. And you have diverse investment opportunities. You are able to invest in things other than stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs. If you can title it, you can probably invest in it with a self-directed retirement account. To me, that's pretty cool. My favorite, my favorite thing to do over and over and over again, if you know me, I'm a rinse and repeat, if it's not broke, don't fix it kind of investor. I like lending. I like lending out of my self-directed account. That is my favorite thing to do. All right. So when self-directed investing, you, the account holder, you make all of the important decisions and investments on behalf of your retirement account through the qualified trustee or custodian. You are responsible for making those decisions. Quest Trust Company is an independent passive custodian. They do not have the responsibility of making sure that it's a good investment. You have that responsibility. You have to do due diligence. You've got to protect your money by using good due diligence and good other investing principles. And you have diverse risks and investment opportunities and you need to know how to minimize the risks while maximizing the investment opportunities. So let's get into this. The first of the three things I want to talk about today, these are three fundamentals three fundamentals that will distinguish you from being a kind of sort of maybe casual investor <clears throat> to somebody that's serious about growing your self-directed accounts. All right. So first off is know your FMV. Some of you are going to be saying, well, Jeff, what's that? Know your fair market valuation. Know it. Let me explain what I'm talking about. You need to know your fair market valuation. You need to know what the value of each investment is. You need to know the state of your investments. There's several verses in the book of Proverbs, one of my favorite passage, one of my favorite books in the Bible, that talk about know the state of your flocks and herds. How are your investments performing? If you don't know what the current value is of a particular investment, how will you know if you're really earning any money? How will you know if you're growing and building wealth? You need to track it. A gentleman that I look up to is one of the inspirational figures of self-directed IRA lending and investing for that fact, for that matter, has a spreadsheet that he maintains for all of his investments. That spreadsheet goes back to 1978 where he has tracked both the projected and the actual performance of every investment he has done. That's right. He tracks both the projected as well as the actual performance of each investment. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. Some of you don't want to know what really went wrong, so some of you have done what I call the ostrich maneuver. You made an investment. You really didn't do the due diligence on it you should have done. 
you're really not sure how it's performing. So just in order to not upset yourself, you don't pay that close of attention to it. Please don't make that mistake. Please don't do that. Instead, you need to dig in and know what's really going on with your investments. You need to know where is it? Are you above water? Or are you below water? And the last thing I have to tell you is this. You have to report an annual fair market value to both Quest so that they can report it to the IRS. You've got to do that. But I don't want you to just once a year look at your account balances and go, oh, well, that investment that I made into that trust or that investment I made into that LLC or that loan I made, I really don't know. No, folks, you need to know what it's really worth. You need to pay attention to it. You need to track it. One of the reasons I love doing lending out of my self-directed accounts is because I can run an amortization table and then I can update the amortization table every month when a payment comes in. And I know how much went to, goes to principal and how much goes to interest and I know what the remaining balance is and I know is that borrower paying on time? How much do I still have left owed to me? How much have I earned in interest? All of that stuff is pretty easy to calculate off those little spreadsheets that we maintain in my office. And I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't maintain them. My assistant does. I'm not allowed to look at the mail until she's processed through it because she's like, if you get your hands on it, I won't be able to know what's there. And then we'll miss a payment or I'll, you'll, you'll have a payment come in and you'll forward it on to the custodian and then, and then I won't know about it. And I'm like, you're right. Okay, I'll look at it after you put it on my desk but you'll put it on my desk after actually do a dual tracking. We actually keep it all on a spreadsheet on the computer and then we keep a hard copy in the file because I keep a separate file folder for every loan I do. It's just part of my underwriting process, part of my loan process. All right, so you've got to know. So you've got to set up some diligent protocols that matter for you. And you're gonna say, well, Jeff, you know, this sounds a lot like work. Folks, listen to me. It's your money. It's your financial future. You've got to do things now that your future self is going to thank you for. One of those things is you've got to track what you've got. You've got to know is it performing or not. It's crucial that you do that. All right, so let me move to the next thing. And this is the topic I'll probably spend a little more time on than the other topics, okay? So let's just see what we got here. Um, I want to just take a look, make sure, okay, good. Um, I need to just do a quick video check here to make sure that my screen's still good. All right, good. So verify then trust. <clears throat> the late, great Ronald Reagan once said, trust but verify. That might work in international diplomacy. But when it comes to self-directed retirement account investing, I'm going to verify before I trust you. I'm going to do my due diligence on you before I put my money to work with you. I'm going to make sure that I do things in a systematic process to know that it's a good deal. And I'm going to tell you one of the advantages that I have by doing that now because I've been doing it for long enough and because I've been systematic about it and because I track things well enough, I have been able to do repeat deals after repeat deals after repeat deals with the same borrowers. And that just makes it easy. But that doesn't mean that I ignore it. No, I go back and I do the due diligence on everyone is whenever they send me a request for a new loan. And so that's a pretty powerful tool. So just to get your attention, let me ask you this question. Are you looking for a long-term relationship or are you looking for a one-night funding partner? I love my long-term relationships. That's what I'm building. That's what I'm cultivating because it's out of those relationships that I get to do multiple deals. It's out of those relationships that I have multiple opportunities to do things that are profitable for both of us. If I just want to do these one-off deals, I'm going to end up getting lured between the contractual sheets and end up left wanting and empty and harmed. 
So no, I don't want to do that. I want to look for long-term relationships. So I am going to be careful about what I do. And so I'm going to use due diligence to verify. Most of you on this call, most of you on this Zoom call, you know how to analyze a deal. But let me ask you this. Do you evaluate your potential borrower, the managing investor, or the counterparty in transaction with the same amount of diligence? Are you diligent with them? Do you invest the same energy evaluating a new deal as you would with a new investing relationship? Are you willing to ask hard, hard questions? Are you proposing answers? Despite how much, how nice they look, despite how pleasant they sound, despite how charming their appearance is, despite how good their clothes look. No, don't get fooled for that. Do not get fooled for that. You want to know about the actual core of the deal. Tell me about the core of the deal. Tell me about those things. So let's get into some questions that drill down into the core of a deal. First question you want to ask is, what would I find if I ran a credit and criminal background check on you? I'll give you an example. We ran a background check, did an application on a potential borrower the other about last month. Everything looked great. It was a, an amazing deal. It was absolutely amazing deal. Looked good, solid deal. Then we discovered that this particular borrower had chosen to not make his own house payment for the last several months because he wanted to just take advantage of having that money and not avail himself of doing what he was supposed to be doing with me. You know, he had the money, he just didn't want to pay. And I'm like, okay, well, if you got the money but aren't paying, then I'm done. We're not doing the deal. Um, it was an investor and you're looking great. Do you have the last two years of business taxes for me to review? Does your business actually make money? You filing your tax returns on time? Those are things that matter to me. Um, nobody's perfect. So what's the worst thing going on about you out there? I'll tell you what the worst thing is about me out there. Jeff's busy. Jeff's hard to get a hold of. Jeff takes a long time to get certain things done. Yeah, that's, that's my rap. I know it. I own it. Okay. Um, key question here. Key question to ask is when can I see a copy of all of the investing documents? I don't want to see your pro forma. I don't want to see your fancy high gloss pictures. I don't want to see the projections of what it will look like. No. I want to see the actual deal docs. I want to see the actual deal documentation. Where's the actual purchase and sales agreement? Where's the actual title commitment? Where's the actual underwriting report? Where's all this? When do I get to see a copy of the actual lending agreement? When do I get to see the joint venture agreement? And by the way, I, I have yet to see a joint venture agreement that I couldn't make substantial improvements to unless it came from Quincy Long. Quincy's got a joint venture agreement that I've seen and I've worked off of that I thought was pretty good. But you, I'll tell you right now, folks, let me, I, I'm going to just go to town on this. I'm litigating a case right now where the joint venture agreement was all about how the profits get split, but was completely silent what happens when you don't make any money. Was completely silent about what happens when the deal goes sideways, who's responsible for what, who bears what percentage of the loss. And so now we're litigating this because the one person thinks, well, I have absolutely no upside. I'm guaranteed to make at least this greater return on my money. No, you decide you to lent the money as a lender if you wanted that. But no, when you come into a joint venture, you're coming alongside of it's a temporary limited partnership. And so your boats rise and fall on the same tide, on the same waves. Another key question to ask in your due diligence, this is down here in the bottom of my screen, entities, do you what states? And I'm going to tell you something. When you get a chance to look at their tax returns and you ask this question, you can start seeing what else they have going on and pay attention to this. I have seen some very scuzzy looking deals where an investor says, hey, I got this great opportunity to buy this property. It's at a great deal. We can, I need some money from you to be able to buy it and fix it up and then resell it. What they didn't say is the entity that they're buying from is an entity that they also co-own and control. And what they're really basically saying is, listen, I got this dog of a house. I'm going to put some lipstick on it. I'm going to take it to the vet. I'm going to take it to the beautician. I'm going to get the hair trimmed. I'm going to get a bow on it, but it's still a dog of a house. And I want you to, put, I want you to lend money against it. 
no, you got to pay attention to these things, okay? Not everybody out there in the self-directed space is playing with your best interest at heart. Search the various Secretary of States for other controlled entities. Search the names of the people that are asking you to get into the deal. Run those names through. If you go onto the Texas Secretary of State's website, yes, you got to pay to register. You got to go through a couple of hoops, but I'm going to tell you it's worth it. It's worth it. You can run the names. You can see what entities they've got. Then you want to check those entities. You want to see are they doing those entities in other states. You want to look at other states. Particularly you want to look to see do they have anything in Nevada, anything in Wyoming, anything in Delaware. And don't forget to check the state of Alaska. A lot of people are moving their LLCs up to Alaska because Alaska's got a couple of really neat rules. Now, if you're like me and you're a huge fan of the state of Ohio, you're gonna have a hard time finding out if somebody owns an LLC in the state of Ohio because LLCs are completely private in the state of Ohio. That's why I love them there. Delaware is another state you gotta check, okay? Google the borrower, Google the managing investor, Google your counterparty, Google anybody else involved in the deal. Google them, look for what shows up. Look and Google all their entities. And don't just look at the first two pages of Google results or DuckDuckGo results or Yahoo or Bing or whatever shows up. Dig into it, dig into it. Um, I've got one particular colleague that uses a um, completely European system for a search engine because it will pull up stuff that um, all the American based search engines won't pull up. And then look for success stories and failure stories on both Facebook, LinkedIn, and other social media sites. And folks, I'm going to tell you right now, if you tell me that every deal you've ever done has always been a winner, we ain't doing business because I don't believe you. I don't believe you. If you tell me how you had a deal that went sideways, how you lost money, but how you learned from it, now I'm interested. Now I'm interested because you're being honest. You've also learned from your lessons and you're willing to admit it. I mean, I've made some whole horrible mistakes, but I've learned from them. And I've shared that wisdom with thousands of other investors so that hopefully they don't make the same mistakes. More due diligence, more verifying before you trust more verifying before you trust. What's your reputation? What is the reputation that they have? Are the person you're talking to, are they an actual full-time investor or are they just a deal promoter? How much skin will they have in the deal? How much will they actually have in the deal? How many deals have they actually completed? What are the performance charts on those? What are the distribution sheets? What are the payoff seats sheets? What are the summaries? What are the reconciliations on that? Where have they gone to learn how to do their investing? Yes, I know you can't get a college degree in it. Um, I've got my PhD from the University of Hard Knocks when it comes to real estate investing, but I've spent a lot of time and a lot of money with other like-minded individuals going to event after event after event and learning from it, okay? Who are you learning from? How long have you, the people that you're learning from, how long have they been investing? If they've only been investing in this latest market cycle from say 2010 forward, they don't know what a down market looks like. This market in the last eight, 10 years has made anybody who buys a house look rich, look smart. I'm sorry, I wanna see the guy that knows how to make money in a sideways market. I really wanna know the people who know how to make money in a down market. Those are the people that interest me. I know a few of them. And finally, who do, who's your attorney? Who's your accountant? Who do you go to for advice? Do you even, well, if you do, that's impressive because that means you're taking this like a mature, responsible adult. It's easier for me to then say, okay, you're passing my verification tests. All right. The other huge thing here on verifying for you trust is the collateral. I'm a huge believer in always having good collateral at the core of the deal. At the core of the deal, there has to be good collateral. Get a description of collateral, all of the collateral. Find out what's going on in the story on that. 
Where's the geographic location of the collateral? Is it proximate to where everybody's involved? What's the transactional history of the collateral? Had a client call me up. She's a good account holder at Quest. She says, Jeff, I want to fund this deal. She says, this person wants to buy this house and rehab it. I said, okay, talk to me about the deal. Went through the deal. She shared with me the address of the property. My team and I pulled it up. We took one quick look at the transaction history and we said, nope, nope, we don't want you to do this one. And she goes, why? I said, have you seen how many times this house has been bought and sold in the last nine months? There's no more meat left on that bone. Transaction history regarding that property. And she goes, oh my, you saved me from making a big mistake. Okay, so pay attention to those kind of things. Some more work on more questions to ask when it comes to asset and collateral due diligence. What's the valuation of the collateral? It's usually a house, it's usually a property. What's the value? What does it rent for? What are the recent valuation variables? That market, how much is owner occupied? How much is vacant? How much is landlord op rented out? What are the demographics in that market? What are the crime indicators in that market? One of the first crime indicators I always want to look at with a particular address is the number of registered sex offenders living in any sort of geographic proximity in a two to three mile radius or less. I want to know that. What are the school ratings? The biggest predictor of a neighborhood's ability to appreciate is the rating of the high school. The best predictor of a neighborhood's ability to appreciate is the rating of the high school. And then I also want to know what's happening. Any major corporate or factory expansions, any new universities coming in, any institutions, how close are you to the to universities? I'm thinking of one particular area that I've been looking at to invest in. Um, they're going to be building a new college campus. You know, the um, PGA has just moved into town. Those are the things that tell me that growth and more growth and more growth is coming to a particular geographic area. And so that's the stuff I look for. That's the stuff because I want to make sure that I'm investing in something that is going to go up in value. I want collateral that's going to be stable and appreciating. I don't want to be on a wing and a prayer and a hope and a hope and you know hope and jump. Okay. And let me leave you with the last couple of words on this area on verifying before you trust. So you've made the decision to trust somebody. Never, never, never send a check directly to the borrower. If you're funding a loan, always tell Quest to send the money to the title company, to the t closing attorney. Never send it directly to the borrower. If you're doing another kind of transaction where you're not closing it in a title company, sometimes you don't, I, some of the deals I do I don't, then have the check sent payable to the borrower, but have it sent to your attention. Do not let the borrower touch that money until all of the documents have been signed to your satisfaction. I have seen multiple deals where once the borrower got the money, they completely forgot about the promises of, oh, oh yeah, we'll get that document edited. We'll fix it. I'll come back and sign it. Nope, gone. Okay. Always send your funds directly to the attorney or title company closing the deal, along with written closing instructions. I'm a huge proponent of if you're serious about lending on a deal, you have closing instructions. And always get title insurance and a closing protection letter wherever appropriate. If you're making a loan on a property, get closing protection insurance in addition to a lender's title policy. So let me give you a couple more things and then we'll be moving to the third element. If you're making a loan on your verifying and trust, Always make sure you have a lender's policy with your custodian name as the named insured. Quest Trust Company, FBO, your name, your account number as the named insured. Make sure that your Quest account is listed as a loss payee on the hazard insurance policy. Make sure that if it's a vacant property that there's force placed insurance on it and that you're listed as a loss payee. And if you make a loan to somebody, and then they abandon the deal, then you've got the right to how tell your account at Quest that direct it to pay for the premium on a force placed insurance policy on a vacant property till you get the house foreclosed and sold. Okay, but you want to make sure that you protect yourself. Because folks with a goal without a plan, well, it's just a wish. It's just wishful thinking. Every one of us that's on this call, we want to grow wealth and we want to do it in a tax-free or tax-deferred manner.
That's a beautiful goal. But unless you have a systemic plan, unless you're systematic about how you're going to do it, unless you have a checklist, a process, a procedure, a routine for doing it, you will not grow. You will not grow. All right. Let's talk about the other thing. And this to me is huge because this separates this separates those folks who are serious about building wealth from those who just think about it, dream about it, talk about it, but don't do it. Are you making monthly contributions to your retirement accounts? Are you making monthly contributions to your retirement accounts? You can set it up with today's electronic banking systems. You can set it up to where money automatically can come out of your paycheck right into your 401k. You can set it up where money can automatically leave your bank account where your money is direct deposited once you get yourself paid and it goes straight to Quest Trust Company going into your HSA, into your Roth IRA, etc. So let's talk about some realities. Understand this, monthly contributions build wealth. Monthly contributions build wealth. If you don't continue to add to your seed corn, you will never plant the field. Persistent consistency is truly the key. You've got to stay after it month in, month out, year after year after year. The people that I see that have seven figures in their retirement accounts have been consistently putting money in their retirement accounts month after month after month, year after year after year. Yes, they are constantly investing, but they're also adding more capital to what they can invest with. They're growing the amount that they can invest with. You've got to get comfortable with money automatically going to your future. Plan it out. Put it as part of your monthly spending pattern that, hey, I know the beginning of every month, Folks, I'm going to tell you, there are four things I know that happen to my paycheck every month. I'm going to just be candid with you. There's four things I know that happen. There's a chunk of money that gets ripped out, goes to my retirement accounts. Happens before I even see it. There's a chunk of money that automatically goes to make a house payment. There's a chunk of money that automatically goes straight to church, part of my consistent monthly giving. And then there's a chunk of money that goes to take care of family obligations. Just happens automatically. It's on, I have it on autopilot. I'm used to it. It's part of my overall planning process. It becomes routine. It becomes just like getting up in the morning, making a cup of tea, brushing my teeth and combing my hair. And you're going to look at me going like, yeah, right now, do you comb your hair today? Yes, but it's a beautiful, humid, windy day. And so that's why my hair looks the way it does. You know, don't be jealous. People like John Cochran would be so jealous of me. And then the last thing I want to tell you is this is, have a plan. You need to have and know how much money you want to retire and by when do you want to have it. Set a goal, figure out what it's going to take to get there. So you start with two known numbers. What date do you want to retire? How far away is that in the future? That's your first number. How many more months you got? And then what do you have now? And so you can start putting those into a financial calculator. Then you can plug in a rate of return. You can plug in a rate of return of anywhere from 8 to 14% to be safe. And then you can say, okay, what's it going to take to get to my future value? And then you'll see what it's going to cost, what it's going to take in monthly contributions, consistently earning between 8 and 14%, whatever number you put in there. And there you have an idea. Um, a mentor of mine by the name of Chris Hogan has an online website called RIQ. You might want to check it out. Um, good man, really enjoy his company whenever I'm around him. Uh, brilliant man in the retirement space. RIQ, Retirement Information Quotient. Uh, what is your RIQ? And um, he calculates it, inflation adjusted and so on. So yeah, it's good there. All right, last slide. The last slide. Folks, I'm serious. If the kind of stuff I talk about is interesting to you, then please go sign up for my free newsletter. It's at WatsonInvested.com. Go ahead, sign up for it, WatsonInvested.com. It's a free newsletter. Comes out most every Tuesday, most every Thursday. You'll hear about Quest events that I'm participating in. You hear my thoughts about where we're going in the economy. It's designed to be confirm It's designed to be information that's usable by investors, real estate agents, entrepreneurs, business owners, etc. Um, if you need to reach me, that's a way to do it. That's my office. Um, 
I'm booked up for the month. I'm, a, I'm completely booked for the through the rest of the February and well into March on some huge projects for some good long-term clients. So you got to be patient with me. Um, you got to be patient with me because I'm a one-man band. I am still training other people to come alongside me. And so let's just do this. Um, Haley, if you're there, I can go ahead and stop sharing my screen and we can just kind of like let the... Yes. Make the talking heads come back on the screen, okay? So I'm going to stop my share and then I'm going to pause my own recording and then we're good. All right. Perfect. Okay. So we do have some questions that have come through. Guys, if you have questions for Jeff, this is a great time to ask them. Be sure to send them to the Q&A box. Um, we've got some questions about fair market values. For FMV reporting, how do you report the non-performing notes value? Is it okay to report the cost of acquisition? Yes. Yes, awesome. Yes, that's a simple answer. That what you spent on it is what it's worth until something changes. If, you, if it's a non-performing note, you bought it for a certain amount, then once you foreclose on it and you sell the property, okay, well now you know the new value. If you buy the prop, if you foreclose on it, then your IRA goes ahead and rehabs the property. Well, now you've changed it from a non-performing note to a property and you've added more money to it. So it's not only is the class of asset going to change, but so is the value. But anyhow, non-performing notes, what you paid for it. Awesome. So uh, another question here, I like this one. Can you use a Coverdell education savings account for real estate wholesaling? If yes, how can you please explain how this works? <laughs> the answer is yes, you can. The next answer is a long wholesaling course that I am sorry, but we don't have time today to do that. But I will tell you that your CISA account can have enough money in it to serve as deposits, to put the money down as a deposit to get a contract to buy a piece of property and then assign the contract in exchange for the assignment fee that goes back into your CISA account. OK, um, but you, the question, the way you asked it is a the really answer the whole thing. Um, go get a good course on wholesaling. Check out what Jim Ingersoll has out there. Check out what my buddy John Cochran has out there. Um, I think because I've worked so much with John on this, I think his wholesaling course is the absolute best because I make sure all the legality and all the paperwork is spot on. But yeah, you can do it with a CISA account. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, let's see another question here. Ah, yes, this is a good one. And I can maybe help to chime in on this one as well. If your self-directed IRA creates a note that has now become delinquent, how does that affect the fair market value? <laughs> First of all, it does affect the fair market value. Um, secondly is how delinquent. Is there collateral behind it or not? Some of the things that we need to know. Um, if you're not sure, or what the fair market value is. Say for example, Haley, I'm gonna run this down a pat a bunny trail and then I'm gonna stop and let you do your thing, okay? Because mm -hmm. I'm gonna drop a I'm I'm gonna drop a gold nugget here and everybody pay attention. I'm dropping a gold nugget right here. Okay. Let's just say your traditional IRA makes a loan secured by a piece of property. Rehabber goes in, guts the house and then stops making the interest only payments. Kind of sounds similar to the fact pattern of the question, right? That at that point in time, the notes in default, the house is gutted. That's when you want to go get an independent third party valuation of what is that note really worth. That's going to basically say, okay, what's the collateral worth right now, less the cost of foreclosure. Okay, so once I get that in writing on a third party independent valuation, now I might want to think about converting that. I might want to think about converting that particular asset out of my traditional IRA to my Roth and take advantage of the tax feature that I've got here for savings. And then maybe that note will start performing again because then I'll get another rehabber in there to take the house over, finish it out, and then all the gains in my Roth. I love it. Yes. Um, yeah, because if you do it when, if you do the conversion when it's not worth as much, you won't pay as much in taxes. Right. So, yes. Um, yep. Now, coming from the 
IRA custodian standpoint of that. Um, you know, it does happen. We do actually have a process to zero value an investment. You know, it we don't like to do it, but it does happen. This is really where the due diligence comes in before you get into the investment. But if you say have loaned out your funds and say maybe there was not collateral tied to that, um, we basically, you can get a third party opinion saying that that investment is not going to be able to be paid back and we can zero value the investment and basically take it off of your account. Now, ideally you would have taken the proper steps beforehand um, to make sure that the due diligence was done. There was collateral and that the documents were structure, structured properly, but we do have a process for it because it does happen uh, sometimes. Let's see. Sorry, just reading through some of the other questions here. Um, this one's really specific. If I own a property in my IRA uh, and I have given someone an option to purchase that property at a set price, is that price my fair market value or would it still be the value of the property? I think it would still be the value of the property there because the option is It would just, still be the value of the property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. be, the, be the value of the property. Yeah. Yeah, the option is too contingent. The option is undefined. You'd want to use what is the county saying for real estate taxes that they think that property is worth. That's what I'd use. I know that's what Quest accepts as a valuation for FMVs for fair market value. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, let's see. And I will say, guys, you know, obviously we have a lot of questions here about fair market values. If you have more questions about these, reach out to us at Quest. We can definitely help to answer all of those for you as far as the supporting documentation, what you actually need. Um, Jeff, it looks like those are all of the questions that we've actually gotten for now. Um, before we kind of sign off for the day, do you have any last thoughts that you would like to leave everyone with um, or anything like that? Well, yeah, there's probably about three things that I would suggest to everybody. Number one, even if you think you know what you're doing with your IRA, schedule a consultation with a Quest specialist. Just do it. Getting somebody else who's knowledgeable and has a different perspective can add significant value to what your overall investing strategy is. Next thing I'm going to tell you is if you're serious about this, you're going to absorb all of the amazing content that Quest puts out on its YouTube channel. Probably that's the best place to go get it all and absorb it all. Um, given the fact that most all the presentation, the best way to see it is going to be to go to the YouTube channel. You can't, you can't look at a slide deck while you're listening to a podcast while you're working out in the gym. Sorry, it just doesn't work. Okay, so podcasting is not a good channel for Quest to distribute the quality of information it does because you got to see it and hear it. The last thing I'm going to tell you is this. Sit down this week and look at your March 2021 spending plan and determine how much are you going to begin to consistently put into your retirement accounts. Because I'm going to tell you something right now, folks, and I'm going to, I'm Haley, I'm going to say it, and I know I'm going to make somebody mad. You ready? If you're spending more money on the automobile sitting in the park, you don't plan on retiring rich, do you? If you're spending more money on the automobile sitting in your driveway than you're putting in the offering plate at your church, you and Jesus need to have a conversation. I'm just going to be serious with you because we're going to talk about investing in things that last a long time. Your retirement is going to last a whole month longer than that vehicle sitting in your driveway. I'm done preaching on that topic. <laughs> okay. well, I Probably made that. somebody mad. I don't care. I don't care either because the information that you offered before that is more than enough. So <laughs> I don't care. Fine with me. Um, but guys, it's so true. Be sure to yeah. make those contributions and you can still contribute for 2020 as well up until tax filing deadline. So you do have a little bit of time to catch up for last year as well. Um, Jeff, I wasn't counting. Was that all three things you wanted to leave them with? Or is that two? It was, uh, we, we, got, we had one year on retirement income. Um, you have to have earned income, earned income in order to make a contribution to a Roth IRA. 
you don't have to have earned income in order to make a contribution to a traditional IRA. So think that out. Um, I know a lot of people that, um, how do I want to say this? They take some of their rental income and they call it a property management fee just so that they can have it as earned income to put it into their Roth IRA. Um, I know some people who are literally taking money from one retirement program, calling it, you know, paying taxes on it and pushing it right into another one that they're then going to convert that traditional IRA to a Roth just in order to continue kicking the can down the road, put more money into their, t into their tax free growth. Yep. Awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for taking time out of your uh, lovely day down there and your <laughs> not freezing cold weather. Um, yeah. Shirt, shirt sleeves, folks, shirt sleeves here sitting outside. So it's beautiful. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm sitting in my office right now and my hands are freezing because the heat's not on in here. But um, guys, to everyone out there that's in Texas or in other parts of the country where it is cold and freezing, please stay safe. Um, make sure you're prepared. I'm about to go dig up all of my plants out of my yard personally. So I hope you guys all have a great get weekend. You, get your animals inside. Yes. Come on, folks, get them inside. Mm -hmm. um, unless it's an animal, you know, livestock that's, you know, it's designed to live outside all the time. Get all those cats and dogs inside. Come on, folks. Let's do that. Okay. All right, man. I'm done. All right. Bye, Jeff. See you later to everyone. Thanks for Peace. joining us today. We will see you in our Thank other you. events coming up this week. Peace. Bye-bye.